Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending Problem Plants, one of the last in Sonoma State University's Dig Into Nature fall series that is operated and, and created by the University Center for Environmental Inquiry. My name is Margot Rollins, and I am a program coordinator with the center. And until COVID-19 hit us, we would do these programs on one of our preserves, either on the Fairfield Osborne Preserve on Sonoma Mountain in Pengrove, or the Galbraith Preserve in Southern Mendocino County. Well, and while we really miss having people on the preserves, it's, this Zoom format has allowed us to reach a broader and larger audience. At this time, we would usually pass around a sign-in sheet but in lieu of that, can everyone please put their full name into the chat box? Uh, that helps us know who's actually here. Before I let our presenter take it away, I wanna tell you just a little bit about the center and how we can be a resource to you, no matter if you're affiliated with the university or not. You might be a student or a faculty member, staff member or not. You might be a member of the community, government employee, or perhaps you work for a nonprofit that is looking for a sustainable environmental solution. Well, the center envisions a North Bay working together to find sustainable solutions. And we invite all of you to get environmentally ready with us. We're building a community of learners and problem solvers across all sectors of society by providing enhanced understanding of our deep connection with the natural world and offering skill building experiences that lead towards sustainable solutions. There are many ways to get involved with us. You can participate in our research projects. You can participate in one of our naturalist training programs. You can lead events like these. You can attend events like these. You can look at the robust data set that we have on our website. And you can partner with us on projects. And there are many, many more things that we probably haven't even thought of that we could work together on. So each of you is a critical element as we work to address the greatest environmental challenges in history. Today, we're gonna to talk about invasive plant species, examining what does invasive mean in this context? How can we identify some of the more problematic species? And what are some management tools and techniques that are available to us? Our leader is Yuta Berger. Yuta is the science program director at the California Invasive Plant Council, uh, known as Cal Ipsy for short. It is a nonprofit that works to stop the spread of invasive plants across California. On this program, we are also partnering with the Anderson Valley Land Trust. They, it's, this is part of our two-year landowners primer series that we've put together with them, and we thank them for supporting our presenters. In this, what we call a deep dive format, YouTube will present for about 35 to 40 minutes, and then we will have a 10 to 15 minute question and answer series session afterwards. The formal program will end at 11, but Yuta and I will stay on Zoom in case she's not been able to answer all of your questions. Uh, I have muted you all and ask that you turn off your video so that we don't have any problems with that. And, but if you find out throughout this program that if there's something that she says that you need clarification on or that is confusing in some way, please tag, put it into the chat box and I will interrupt her if it seems like something that we need to address right in, the, in that time. Otherwise, put your questions in there as they come up to you, as you, they occur to you, and I will ask them of her toward the end of the session. This is being recorded, and it's going to be posted on our website, cei.sonoma.edu slash calendar slash past events. I will be sending out an email to all of you and let you know when the recording is available. It usually takes about seven days for us to get that up there. So with that, Yuta, please take it away and tell us about these noxious little plants that we're dealing with, most of us. Sure, glad to. Thank you, Margo. Let me just share a screen here. Are you seeing my presentation? Yeah. Okay, let me move this back over again. Give me one second to do some adjustment here. Okay, all right. Well, 
Here we go. Uh, thank you, Margo, and thank you to the Center for Environmental Inquiry and the Anderson Valley Land Trust for inviting me to present to you today, as Margo said, about invasive plants. Um, it is unfortunate that I couldn't be with you in person. Um, I will make the best of it here. And um, it is, it's sad that we can't make it any more interactive, but um, I'm hoping we're gonna have a, a lively discussion at the end of the, the presentation. Uh, the silver lining to this is that we do have more folks from further away that will be that are able to join. We had a, a, someone from Pennsylvania, I think, and um, uh, a couple from Southern California even um, in the uh, attendee list. So a little bit of background first. Um, well, one of the, the reasons I'm excited to talk to you today um, and, and take uh, Margo's invitation is I, I was really surprised to see uh, that I, I wasn't recognizing a lot of names in the invitee list. So that means um, you are an audience who is very interested in invasive plants and you may not be all that familiar with um, some of the resources that are out there available to you. Um, through the California Invasive Planet Council. So that's great. It's a, it's a good outreach opportunity for me and our organization. Um, so we, as Margo mentioned, we're an environmental nonprofit organization. We were formed in 1992, in part actually a, as a spinoff from the uh, California Native Plant Society. Um, there were a, a core group of folks that were especially um, interested and concerned who wanted to put special emphasis on invasive plants and, um, and addressing them in the context of preserving uh, of native plants. So uh, the organization began as an all volunteer organization and we transitioned to being staff run in the uh, mid um, or early mid uh, 2000s. And, and I came on board in late 2018. Our mission is to protect California's environment and economy from the damaging effects of invasive plants. Um, so what do we do? We are a little team of six um, paid staff and a gigantic network of land managers that help to provide information um, across the state um, and really active volunteers as well and some agency folks. Um, we have a, a very active um, working board of uh, 15 to 18 people uh, usually. And um, our, uh, the, our scope includes uh, advocating for sound invasive plant management of wildland habitats partnering in translational research that's taking actual um, fundamental research and, um, and applying it to you know, on the ground issues, uh, developing and providing informational resources such as our uh, relatively well-known state invasive plant inventory, uh, prior de developing prioritization tools, for invasive plant management and best management practices. So how best to, to do the work you need to do um, and how to do it most uh, safely. We advocate for uh, conservation policy and funding at the state level. Uh, most recent, recently for uh, uh, the um, weed management area, the refunding of the state weed management area program, which is now being run uh, again, by the California Department of Food and Agriculture and uh, the uh, state bio, we've, we've been quite involved in the state biodiversity program as well. Um, so we're, we're really trying to support, support land managers out there on, on all levels. We facilitate trainings and regional management strategies across the state as well. Currently, we're working with the CDFA to develop um, regional um, priority lists for um, across the state for top weeds that could be locally um, eradicated or, um, or contained. So we're a membership and a grants-based organization um, that I began as a member with this organization then joined the board and then joined the staff. Um, we have grants from federal um, state agencies and foundations. 
Our members include uh, local, state, and federal land managers, agencies, private land trusts, utilities, volunteers, academic researchers, just generally passionate people. So if you are excited about this at the end of the, the, uh, the talk, feel free to consider joining our, uh, our team, our organization. All right, so let's start out because it is a weighted term really um, with a definition. Right? So you know what I mean when I'm talking about an invasive plant um, versus some of the other terms that are uh, bandied about. So an invasive plant, the most sort of generally accepted um, definition of it, one that we use is it is a non-native plant that is spreading, that spreads rapidly and that impacts the ecology and ecosystem in its introduced range. Um, now, invasive plants uh, that we are concerned about as an organization are ones that, you know, they are, they are scored highly as invasive if they are outcompeting our native flora for resources such as space, light, water, nutrients, if they can create monocultures, uh, just replacing natural vegetation communities, if they degrade rangeland, if they increase the risk of wildfire and flooding, if they consume valuable water resources or reduce habitat for wildlife. And uh, so that's fairly broad. Uh, the a weed in contrast, a, a weed uh, is a, a very general term. Basically a weed is anything you don't like, <laughs> you don't want. So um, a weed, at, like in a vineyard potentially, uh, an oak sapling, a uh, post live oak sapling could be a, a weed because it's not wanted there, right? Um, that is not part of the scope that, um, that Calypsi deals with. Um, although we do understand that in certain settings, certain species become problematic. We also don't really uh, deal with some ornamental plants um, or, or other problem plants in a, in a highly landscaped environment. Um, so in a yard, you know, you might have a, a, a beautiful flower that you have planted in a bed and it's now expanded and decided to take over your lawn. If that doesn't get out into a wildland habitat, we, we kind of draw the line there, although we're curious about it, we're not, um, we, we don't really tend to, to incorporate that in our scope. There are some species that, there are a lot of species that bridge that both areas and the truly, the highly invasive species are um, oftentimes problematic across all landscapes. So, so um, I just need to add this beautiful photo here as an, uh, sort of a reminder, and this is ever more important uh, in this day and age as we see so much change happening and maybe so much disturbance are also in our landscapes. Uh, California's landscapes, I mean, it is an extremely biodiverse state and it's also got a lot of ports and it's got a lot of people and it's got a lot of action and it's got a lot of fire. Um, going on out and a, just a lot of disturbance on, on, all, on all levels. Um, historically, um, there were, uh, you know, a, there was a, a fairly different flora in, in, a lot of, in a lot of parts of the state. This picture here is um, from where I was living previous to 2018, which is in Southern California in Orange County after a wildfire in an area that is not uh, it was pretty much uh, unimpacted um, by invasive species. So you can see this amazing annual wildflower regeneration that if, the, if that site had been highly um, degraded by annual mustards and annual grasses that had sort of tamped out these species and their seed banks, this would have been a very different scene. It would have been one species rather than in that single picture, I can see seven different wildflower species and not a single, uh, and a single non-native. So it's something, it's kind of good to have that reference. Like let's make sure we keep an, uh, not only an eye on what we, we wanna do, but uh, how we're trying to manage, but also you know, what we're trying to preserve and, and what, it, what it once was. So invasive species, 
uh, can uh, come in uh, by multiple means, both uh, consciously being introduced and unconsciously. Um, the conscious introductions have been and continue to be through uh, the agricultural trade. So historically, artichoke thistle, fennel, black mustard, arundo were all consciously brought in for, um, for uh, agriculture and, uh, and in the case of Arundo, uh, in part for uh, living fences and erosion control. And also the nursery trade is surprising how many species that were brought in through the nursery trade have jumped the fence and are now problematic elsewhere. And probably one of our most well-known examples are the, the various brooms, all the broom species. Scotch broom, French broom, Spanish broom, all of those brooms, they're beautiful. They're, they've got gorgeous yellow flowers. They were brought in as, as yard plants. And even now still, I get reports of, of people taking wild like French broom and planting it into their yard because they think it's so pretty. Um, so these, these plants were introduced as ornamentals and they have escaped and they have um, done very well in a non uh, uh, non-landscaped environments. Pampas grass is also an example. Uh, unconscious means of introduction have been ship ballast. Uh, for instance, ice plant, many species were brought in by, um, by the sand and the, the soil that was, from, um, that was put in as ballast into ships coming over to California. And when they unloaded um, the, the ships and um, were ready to take on cargo, then they they, they uh, got rid of that, that ballast. That, so there were huge you know, amounts of, uh, of material that, were, that sort of landed on our shores with whatever seed had come from the source area. Uh, seed contaminants in grains um, and in hay, and that's how yellow star thistles come in. Many, many of our annual grasses have come in that way and perennial pepper weed as well has come in. So, um, that's how things have gotten in and that, you know, that is continuing to happen. And uh, we have state and federal agencies trying to keep an eye on, um, on what's imported, um, but it's very hard to, to find everything that's coming in. Same goes for insect pests and, and pathogens. So this is, um, this is a very, within the invasive species uh, community, a very well-known graph and that displays the invasion curve. So when a plant or an animal or an insect or a pathogen is first comes into uh, a new environment, uh, there are very few of that individual, right? And maybe it's not going to persist. A lot of times it doesn't persist. Um, most species that are introduced actually die out. You know, it's a, it's a tough thing. New environment, not very many individuals to mate with, um, but a few of them do. So at that very early stage, if it is an invasive species, that is the best time. If you know from another country that, you know, like this has been a real problem in Australia and we just found 10 plants here in, the, in California, that is a red alert for us. And we do everything we can to push for eradication of that, of that plant. Prior to that coming in, we have prevention uh, uh, mechanisms, which are uh, inspections at borders and so, such things. So we have that early stage where there's hardly any individuals where you could still eradicate. Then you have a stage where you have pockets of that plant. And this is a case of um, alligator weed, for instance, right now as a, as a great example of that. There's a lot of emphasis now on trying to contain alligator weed because this is an aquatic um, plant in the um, in the uh, buckwheat fam. No, in is it in the buckwheat family? I think um, it, that has spread through boats, and we're we're trying now, um, or the state is trying to keep it in very localized areas. Ideally, ultimately eradicating it, but. The, the main goal right now is to, to make sure it doesn't hit other waterways. That's called containment, also works for, for land plants. And then beyond that, you get into, you know, so a lot of our rangeland weeds, which have expanded, you know, crazily, and they are, include the brome grasses, the yellow star thistle, where you're really doing what we call asset-based protection. If you 
you are wanting to protect your, your rangeland, you know, you're trying to do whatever you can to get the cover of that unwanted plant from something like 80% to something like 20%. Ideally, yes, you would try to eradicate it or contain, contain it so it doesn't, it's no longer in your area, but you may not even be able to manage that. So you want to keep those numbers down. And so the different things that you need to do at those different um, stages to be successful. Um, one tool that we have uh, developed for helping folks to understand whether the species that they're interested in is like out of the out of the gate, you know, already, or whether it's something that could be contained or even eradicated is, um, and also to know how invasive that species is. It's called our um, our uh, statewide inventory. So this um, was uh, formalized in the early 2000s and has been developed as, um, further since then. We have now over 250 species on this um, site. Now this, as you can see on the little header there, this is um, freely viewable by anyone and everyone um, through calipsy.org uh, and then you look under plants and then inventory. And you will be able to see this list. If you click on any, any species in that list, you will get an assessment that was made for that particular species as to its invasiveness. So there's two types of assessments that we've done um, and that we do for our species. If it's an invasive plant that, or a plant that we think is invasive. Somebody's nominated it and we have the resources to actually review it. It goes through a process called um, a, a plant assessment. We use a plant assessment form. There, there are standardized questions. Um, there are 13 questions that have to do with environmental impact, rate of spread, ecological amplitude, how many different environments can it grow in. And out of that, we get a score. The, out of that assessment, we get a score. And that score, um, that will give it a rating of limited, moderate, or high. Highly invasive species, yellow star uh, thistle is an example. They kind of check every box. They reproduce quickly. They have a huge impact. Um, they uh, can grow in a lot of different environments. They basically do it all anywhere and everywhere. The other uh, more recently developed uh, tool that we are using is called a pre-assessment. And this was developed um, in collaboration with Calypsi, but based out of um, UC Davis, out of Jody Tommaso, who is a guru of, of weed science, recently, unfortunately, retired. Um, and this pre-tool uses 20 criteria why are we using a different tool? This is for species that haven't expanded in California yet. So we don't have data for California. We have to use this as a predictive tool rather than an assessment of what's going on on the ground in California. So uh, it uses 20 criteria. It looks at um, a lot of the same criteria, but it also does climate matching. Like, is this species invasive in other regions of the world? And are those other regions of the world that it is invasive in climatically similar to California and even to future scenarios for California? So the final um, risk rating is it's a different kind of a scoring method, um, it's sort of one to I think 24 or 25. And anything that is scoring higher than a 15 gets a um, rating as a watch species and gets uh, added to our list. Anything lower that we still we're keeping an eye on, but we don't have enough data to say that it is um, potentially going to be invasive in California. So this is a predictive tool instead. So that, that's a really valuable list. And if anyone is interested and hasn't, doesn't know that, I really want to take a look at that. And I'll talk a little bit more about it later again. Um, that now going on to um, approaches to control, um, they you know we were talking about uh, you know wildlands and also the the containment versus the asset protection. It's also it's important um, 
when you're thinking of controlling the invasive plants in the area that you're concerned about to know and understand what your goals are. And it's important for us to understand them too. So we did a survey recently of, um, of folks in, in the Calypsi communities or land managers that we had on our, on our um, contact lists. And we, this is kind of the result that we got from that survey that about a little over half of the folks that are controlling invasive plants, or maybe they're considering them weeds in this case, um, are doing it for conservation reasons. They're maintaining plant, native plant diversity or cover and uh, main, want, doing it to maintain or improve wildlife habitat. A lot of folks are also doing uh, invasive plant management for a lot of other reasons, such as, especially these days, reducing fuel loads, flood control, like Arunda removal for flood control, uh, maintaining working lands, maintaining rangelands um, and for, for uh, cattle or uh, and dairy production. So um, that's kind of important to know. And then um, when you're engaging, whatever your reasons for, for doing your invasive plant management, when you're engaging in that management, you have to be, um, cognizant of the potential uh, risks involved in doing the management, what kind of impacts might you have, and, and doing something and not doing something, and what tools are available to you. And the, um, the key term to use in taking a more holistic, comprehensive you know, look at it is integrated pest management. You're not just um, bludgeoning something with a hammer. Just because you have a backpack sprayer with a bunch of Roundup in it, you're, you know, that's just the thing that you go after whenever you see something new that you don't think you might not like. That may, that's not integrated pest management. That's a little bit of like the, the hammer. Same thing, it doesn't, it could be if you, if you're taking a, you know, a plow to anything that you're, you, you don't like out there, that's not integrated pest management. That's you, what you need to, consider with integrated pest management is all the tools available to you. We like to call it on your tool belt. One of them is prevention. You know, let's say you're, you own a ranch. Um, prevention is, and, and, and you're trying to keep the quality of your, um, of your pastures as high as possible. Um, prevention is a key thing. New equipment coming in needs to be cleaned. If you're, any, any equipment or any thing coming in from outside has the risk of bringing with it propagules. So that is where you at a very local scale can uh, exercise prevention and even doing site checks, making sure in the most disturbed areas, like for instance, you get a, a load of gravel from somebody, you really wanna make sure that that gravel is not bringing something in. So it, that, those are, um, those are, uh, prevention tools, cultural and sanitation tools. That's stopping the spread from within your, uh, your land area. So you have a patchy distribution of something. You don't want it to get everywhere. If you know you have a problem in the Northeast corner, you keep whatever is in the Northeast corner in the Northeast corner. And then you have um, physical and mechanical controls. If you have isolated onesies, twosies, go out there and, and pull them. You know, get, If you see something bad, don't wait until three weeks from now, um, just just pull it now and um, use whenever possible, use a um, physical and mechanical um, a means. There's also biological um, tools for some of these species. It could be that it is targeted grazing. It could be that it is an actual biological control agent that was brought in that you need to be aware of because that yellow star thistle population that you have on your, on your land it, it, there are actually several biological control agents um, that are moderately effective on it. You wanna know, are they on your land? Are they on your plants? How well are they doing? What can you do to help them do the best at controlling your plant um, so you don't have to do other stuff? And then we have chemical uh, methods as well with um, which uh, are to be used in context with, um, with all of the other me uh, methods. And, uh, Calypsi as an organization embraces all these tools together to be used in an integrated fashion um, and to be used uh, wisely to 
the, the best possible outcome for, for the habitat. Yuda, you may, maybe you're going to address this later, but a question yes. is in um, from Henry saying, I don't see prescribed burns listed as part of the approach for integrated pest management. Can Are, are you going to talk about that's that? Almost a, that's almost, that's a lump. There's a lot of sub methods within those and that kind of falls into cultural um, controls. And yes, burning is, burning is a method and grazing is a method of, of maintaining habitat. So I will get into a little bit. We can also talk about it after um, the end. It is not a great method for single species control. It is a good method for maintaining um, like a like a perennial grassland um, in uh, dominated in one way. You're not going to ever be able to get rid of a plant um, entirely with burning alone. Okay. So yes, thank you. Sure. Okay, as I mentioned um, in the little. Uh, hierarchy there, um, the, um, the uh, triangle. Uh, prevention is, is really key and it is the cheapest, best test thing that you can do. Um, so it, in order to do prevention, you have to understand how much really can get in without considering it. Um, and you have to understand the routes by which it can get in. For me, as a past land manager down in, in Southern California, I was um, painfully aware of how much was brought in by um, the, the neighboring orchards uh, that were moving equipment and that whose, whose staffing we were using, somewhat you know, oblivious to this prevention issue with their equipment and not paying full attention to their equipment, you know, how, how maybe dirty their equipment might be so that they were inadvertently bringing seed sources in. I also once did a, uh, a check on my own boots. I'd gone a whole day slogging through a canyon. I got back home, uh, shook out my boot, took tweezers to it, and I found, uh, I think, nine different species of weeds in, in my boot. So um, know that you and a lot of other things can be moving, um, moving seeds around. And then you also want to address areas that are vulnerable to, uh, to invasion. And so that means that you are on the land that you're interested in, you're kind of prioritizing some sites because you don't have a ton of resource. Nobody's going to ever have enough to manage you know, their area to the level that they want to. What, what areas are you most concerned about? Put higher effort there. And, um, and then surveillance EDRR is a code word for early detection, rapid response. Keeping an eye out for new things popping up in your area and plucking them out as soon as you see them so they don't spread and become a multi-thousand dollar project um, or multi-hundred thousand dollar project. Um, so lots of, of different um, resources available on our red website. We have three or four different manuals now for best management practices to prevent weed um, spread under different, you know, uh, under different scenarios, and there's a whole national program called Play Clean Go, and as a as a um, like a land trust or a conservancy, so or as a landowner, you can sign or an agency, you can sign up with them and sort of get a packet of pre-branded uh, material, including boot brushes at trailheads and all of that that um, help to reduce um, the movement of, uh, of weed seeds around. There's also a spin-off of that called Work Clean Go that has uh, protocols associated with it. So these are, all, um, the, the BMPs are available on the resources page in our website. All right, now moving to uh, the different techniques um, of which fire is one. Um, for uh, for weed control and habitat management, um, and uh, they are both. You know, uh, we have chemical control, we have cultural control, we have mechanical control, we have biocontrol, and all of those um, are integrated together. We're actually in the final stages of working up a another best management practices guideline, which has 
um, 21 non-chemical techniques, each with a minimum of five pages written about them and what species they're most, uh, or what types of species they're most effective on. And we are working with the UC IPM program to uh, develop a, in the, in the midst of doing that right now, to develop a, an online decision support tool. So you can type in the character traits of the plant and the site that you're interested in, and it will provide you with a, um, a, a list of, you know, the, the highest rated uh, uh, non-chemical techniques that you can use. So this is for folks that specifically want to stay away from uh, working with um, herbicides. They may have legal restrictions to that, or they may have personal uh, restrictions as well, because it's just looking at non-chemical. Here are examples. We have biocontrol. We have subsurface severing. We have mulching. For Southern California, um, there is solarization. There's girdling, there's grazing, weed whacking, multiple cutting with, um, with clippers, uh, loppers and saws of perennial plants and various methods of manual removal and extrication. Um, and there's also flaming as well and even uh, steaming now as a non-chemical technique. So those are all included in this manual that's coming up. It is not on the website yet, but we're hoping by the end of the year it will be. And then um, that used in conjunction with, uh, with a, um, a chemical techniques is um, often the most effective way for getting rid of, of uh, particular species and, um, and maintaining uh, habitats. There are various ways one app um, does, uh, can do um, herbicide applications and many, many different types of herbicides to use. Um, and I am, uh, you know, not qualified to give specific recommendations of those. You would want to go to a, um, uh, a um, pest control advisor and um, to your UC Extension office. Um, and you also want to have the proper training to use that. But we have things like um, backpack spraying. We have low-dose spraying over a slightly broader areas. We have drizzle spraying where you use... Um, you have a lot less drift um, to apply to your um, to your target species, and then there are things like stump cut in the lower right. That little blue outline. You cut a tree down, and you just treat the cambium with the chemical, and that gets sucked down into the um, into the uh, um, roots um, to kill the plant. That's for things that are really difficult and maybe can't be. Um, eliminated um, manually. And then a smaller version of the stump cut is for smaller woody seedlings with a spray bottle. Um, here are some of the, um, the my favorite resources currently. Um, the one I cannot recommend enough if you want to get into this, if you want to wade in, <laughs> is the weed control for nat in natural areas, the primary of, of, in the Western United States. It has, I don't know, over a hundred species listed and it has a description of the species. It has mechanical techniques that work, cultural techniques that work, biological techniques that work, um, agents that are, in, uh, and then it has the chemical um, agents that have been tried on, the, the herbicides that have been tried and the application rates. Uh, that are uh, that are recommended for that species, and it is uh, it's a real uh, treasure of a resource. Again, the primary author is none other than Jody Tomaso from UC Davis. He also is um, the primary author of Weeds of California and Other Western United States. If you have space in your bookshelf, it will take up probably a half a foot um, because it's a two volume set. And it has uh, a massive amount of information on it, but that's more helpful for identification than for treatment. It has a little bit of information on treatment. If you're specifically interested in yellow star thistle, there is a whole management guide on yellow star thistle um, that is available as well. These um, books are available, those, those three books are available on the UC um, Website. They are also available um, through our website, through our shop. Our shop, however, is currently closed. So you would want to, if you're really interested in one of those, 
um, I can see if I, um, you can email me and I will um, put, and your patient with, with waiting, it may take a month to get the book. I will put you on a, a list and we'll try to get that, um, uh, the store open so you can, can purchase those books. The last one on the left is the Weed Workers Handbook. We put that out a while ago. Unfortunately, it's out of print. However, you can get uh, the PDF for free of the Weed Workers Handbook as well as the Yellow Star Thistle Management Guide um, at uh, our, through our website, um, through the resources page in the library. And within the plant, plant profiles that we have for our inventoried species, you will get for every species that has an entry in the weed control and natural areas, you can, there is a link to a PDF that you can download for free as well. So, so now three species um, that I'm gonna talk about uh, that you folks had um, had uh, asked for more information on. We had, I think, a total of, um, Marco, was it 19 uh, respondents? I think there may have been a couple more now, right? 21? I think we had, yeah, about 17 respondents and they identified 19 oh, different right. species Seven. as being problematic. Right, 17 respondents, 19 species. Um, a lot of them were uh, like single, person, single, <laughs> single plant. So I won't be able to cover all of those, but I am hoping by the end of this talk, you'll have um, the resources to be able to um, find out more about them or we can talk about them in the Q&A. Um, and then there are three species that multiple people had um, said they were interested in. The first one is uh, Scotch broom. So Scotch broom is one of those ornamentals um, that was uh, that escaped, that um, jumped the fence. It is native to Europe and the British Isles. It was introduced in the mid 1800s and um, it is uh, highly rated. Um, uh, you've heard about our inventory. So um, in our inventory, it received a high rating. So highly invasive. Um, it is a, a difficult, very difficult plant to manage primarily because it has an 80 year seed bank. That means if you screw up one year and you let seed fall into the ground, um, you have a long time to pay. If you're, and you're really trying to get rid of that plant on your site, you have a long time to pay for it. The other problem is it's favored by fire. So it likes open ground. Um, it will establish, it has been establishing and spreading in a lot of these um, areas that have been impacted by our recent wildfires. And, um, and then once it establishes, you know, individual shrubs, I'll talk about how one can get rid of them. But one of the challenges are wherever you control, you have to stay on it at that site because of the long seed bank. Um, and there are some ways of encouraging the seeds to germinate uh, as well, but still it's very difficult to manage. Um, it is unpalatable for many species. Uh, goats seem to be beginning to, it's either this or French broom, find a little, uh, uh, they, they are um, enjoying it. Uh, and so you can get some grazing control and uh, wildlife may be beginning to start to um, use it a little bit. Um, it produces a ton of seed too. All right, so how to, um, to control it. What I'm providing to you is from, uh, from presentations that are also linked to the species profile on our website, as well as um, the uh, weed control for natural areas document. So, um, and a little bit of uh, experience with other, um, with other broom species. Um, the, there are several uh, chemicals that work on it. They seem to be more effective in, um, at least a subset of them, uh, more effective in the fall than in the spring. A foliar application works as well as a drizzle um, application. Um, as, and I think both of those are a little more effective than a stump cut. So uh, that is one tool. Another tool is, um, if you have only one or two plants or a handful of plants in an area, you definitely, you can remove it very effectively with a weed wrench. It has a deep root, Take, do that in, in uh, soft soil. A weed wrench is, Google it, you'll find out what it is. It's a cool tool. 
Um, and there are other companies, there are different companies that provide various versions of this. It's a way of leveraging out a deep rooted um, a shrub and um, cutting can work as well in the spring to the summer. Um, you don't want to, uh, to cut late in the year when all of, this is a deciduous plant. So late in the year in the fall, all the resources go back down into the roots. So if you cut the thing in the, in the above ground, it's gonna say, I don't care. And it's just gonna re-sprout again. So um, if you cut a species like this, unless it's really a drought year, you're gonna have to be cutting it multiple times in order to kill it. Um, definitely, a single cut will not kill the species unless it's a really dry year. Biological control agents, there are a couple. So if you have the species on your land, uh, crack open a pod next time you uh, pass by a pond and, and see if you can see beetles in it. There are two different beetles that are on it and they're moderately effective. So there's a low, there's an amount of control that current biological control agents are exhibiting on this. And um, make sure, because you know about the seeds now, that, the, uh, that you control onesie twosies first before you hit the big population and you and you all so the leading edge also you can control seedlings through flaming in um in uh areas uh, like using a flamer in areas where you're making sure you don't actually cause a fire by doing that and so the, the plants need to be somewhat moist um yes uh, we only have 10 minutes remaining until 11 um, but I think this is what people really are interested in. Uh huh. Yeah. And so I. Oh, because we had we started a little later because I. Oh, and, and I am going long. Sorry about that. Yes. Well, okay. I, I think I'd like you to continue with this. Um, but if and there are a couple of questions in here. I hope people are okay staying on until a, a little bit after eleven to allow you to get the questions. My my call on this is let's let's have you go ahead and finish what you're doing now. Uh, okay. We will wrap up right at eleven, and then people please stay on uh, with some specific questions that you might have, and I'll ask the questions that have already come in. Okay. All right. I will uh, try to rocket through some other. Um, if I have other slides that are not as important, tree of heaven is the second species. Um, it's fairly um, broadly distributed now. It's a tree from, um, from Asia. It, is a, it was also imported as an early into ornamental. It was also imported in uh, the mid 1850s. It's a problem down in Southern California and in patches up here in Northern California, but also across the United States, especially across the Southern uh, states. It looks superficially a bit like walnut or pecan, but the leaves stink. And they also have that red midrib. The, they do have a little bit of a different form and they're a bit um, glossy as well. The fruits have this reddish orange look to them. So obviously the fruits are very different. Um, and the seeds are not nearly as dormant, but they do have a little bit of dormancy. It is also favored by fire. Um, it also regrows with any kind of, this is not a species that you wanna cut. It will regrow every time you cut it and it propagates itself very well from root sprouts. Um, so a lot of times it's not the seed production, it's that you have an established plant that starts multiplying under, underground um, with suckers that come up. So if you're cutting, you're gonna promote suckers um, to come up, don't cut the species. Um, the chemical control is also not a stump cut uh, recommended, it's basal bark treatment uh, again, you want to look at that guide that I showed you. Mechanical, if it's a single plant or a, you know, not a, a throng of plants like this, uh, a weed wrench um, works uh, well to um, digging it out. Well. You just need to get the roots out because that's where the um, plant is regrowing from and you need to get all the roots out. Um, you need to stay on top of re-sprouts for this. I have treated this plant um, it has and waited a year, not seen it in the second year, but in the third year, re-sprouts came up again from underground structures. So um, stay vigilant. There are no biological control agents. Another way to just environmentally control this plant is um, through shading. It does not like shading at all. So if you have other 
other plants, if you have a canopy um, forming, you'll be helping to uh, reduce the spread of this. Fire again is very uh, favor favors this species. The last of the three species is yellow star thistle. This is by many considered the worst species, uh, the most economically devastating in uh, the state of California. Um, it was introduced uh, incidentally uh, through hay and seed in the, from Eurasia in the, around the 1850s, perhaps earlier than that. It's a, a winter annual. It blooms in the summer. It has a relatively a moderate seed life for three to five years, so which is good news because if you can really control a site for three years without allowing any seed production, then you're looking pretty good. You're going to be able to, um, to uh, probably get rid of this species at your site. It has gray leaves. They're sort of, uh, the stems are winged, as you can see on the left here. Um, and the flower head has long, sharp spines. Notice here in the, um, the image, the right flower head is a different species. It's called Tocolote, which is Centauria melitensis. And the one on the left is yellow star thistle with the horrendous spines, Centauria solstitialis. And the one on the, the solstitialis is, um, they're both bad weeds. The one on the left is definitely the worst one um, and is also obviously not uh, fun forage for um, cattle when it is fully formed like this. It can produce a lot of seeds. Um, control. Uh, is um, there are there are uh, sunflower specific um, herbicides that can be used on this, and you go see that management guide that I um, that I showed you. The there's also manual removal. We've done a lot of um, hand pulling of this. If it, as long as it's um, it, it takes a while for the seeds to disperse, but if it's in full flower like this, up and it's easy to see, you just pull it, but you do need to bag it at this point. If it's prior to full flower, you don't have to bag it. You can just pull it and leave it on site. Uh, and uh, some grazing works with this, but it's not going to be uh, the end all for, for getting rid of the species on site. Lots of biological control agents have been introduced in this. Um, not all of them are effective at all. A few of them include, that are more effective, include the false peacock fly, the hairy weevil, and the rosette weevil. Rosette weevil was just introduced or uh, approved and is being introduced this year for the first time. So you want to, to, to see what, what, how the agents are doing on your site and make sure to control the leading edge. All right. Some of our other, the other species that were recommended um, to be talked about by participants, I'll just go into a couple of categories here. Um, things to control. So uh, moving more into to categories, because that's an easy way to sort of get guidance for yourself on how, um, on how to control species. You want to find out, if you're worried about a species, find out more about it. Is it an annual or a perennial? Is it a forb or a tree? Does it regrow from the roots or the rhizomes? If it does regrow from the roots or the rhizomes, you've got to be careful about cutting it. And does it have a taproot? If it has a taproot, it's gonna be easier to pull. If it doesn't have a taproot, it may be more difficult and may cause more disturbance if you're pulling it. When does it flower? Whatever treatment you do, if, it, if you're trying to prevent seed production that year, you have to do it before flowering and enough time before flowering so that it, Either you can come back and make sure it doesn't flower and come back and control again or that to make sure it doesn't flower at all in that year. How long does it flower? If it has a prolonged flowering period, it's going to be more difficult to control. Is it deciduous? If something dies back in the fall, it means its carbohydrates are moving from above ground to below ground every year. And you can capitalize on that with chemical control. With mechanical control, it just makes it less effective at the tail end of the year. Um, how much of the seed, seed dormancy? It means how vigilant are you going to have to be year after year? What are your site conditions? Because not all site conditions are going to be a favor all uh, methods of control. And what are your uh, financial and uh, time resources? What are your risks? What's the risk to wildlife? Are you, are you impacting wildlife by doing the work that you're doing? 
um, a couple of other groups, you know, examples, bunch grasses, um, harding grass, panic veld grass were, um, were suggested also to talk about. Those are perennials. You can remove them manually um, if you have isolated um, if you have isolated clumps uh, with a pick or a mattock. It's a lot of work. Uh, you can do uh, multiple times mowing low to the ground. Um, a lot of times, this is most effective or grazing. Um, those are difficult to be effective alone, but they can be combined with herbicide. Like do that cutting first, let the regrowth come up and then treat with an herbicide. Again, you can see um, uh, suggestions in the manual. And then you need to do this for about three years to kill, to kill those plants. It doesn't have a long seed bank. Pernicious perennials like oblong spurge and pokeweed, um, you need to treat them and remove them before flowering. Um, you, uh, oh, I have the incorrect comments on this, so do not read my text on that um, at all. And, and uh, instead, uh, there was a recent, for Oblong Spurge, there was a recent presentation. We had a symposium two, three weeks ago and by Scott Onetto, and he talked about um, multiple methods for Oblong Spurge control, and he has a drizzle technique that he uses with Mazapir for those who are okay with using chemicals that was extremely effective. He also says that uh, well-timed grazing and cutting can be somewhat effective with this. Uh, pokeweed individual plants can be manually removed. Um, you follow, you can also look in the manual for um, additional guidance on that. The resources that we have available, I would strongly encourage you to look into. All of them can be found at www kawaipsi.org. They include plant, plant, prof, plant profiles, which are sort of a clearinghouse for all this information, a resource library, symposium archives, um, a lot of other information for each species and for methods in general, and uh, even training uh, videos for flaming, training videos for uh, weed whacking. And we have a Big volunteer. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to. Okay, catch. I'm sorry. I don't, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and that is okay because we are done. All right. Uh, so please go go to Utah's website. Um, I will be sending you information when we get the recording up. So all of this will be at your fingertips. And it looks like the website has many many things on it. And I really appreciate all of you being here. I hope you all learned a lot and feel much more knowledgeable about the invasive species you're concerned about. We have three more events coming up into our Dig Into Nature Fall series, so please check them out at cei.sonoma.edu slash calendar and register for one or all of them. We are now putting together our spring series, and if you have some topics that you would like to see us address, please send them to me. I think you probably all have my email in the confirmation documents that you received when you registered. Uh, we also have one coming up on a winter writing walk with one of our former uh, lecturers, Lake and Khan, which will share tips for breathing life into your nature writing. And there's one on assistive photography for people who need help with access in nature with their photography. So thank you all again very much for joining us. Thank you, Yuna, so very much for all of this information. And stay safe. And we hope to see you all again. <laughs>